when Ford Motor Co. debuted its $300,000 Mustang GTD in Carmel, California. Chief Executive Officer Jim Farley wasn't shy about what he aimed to intimidate. Uh, we looked at what Porsche had done with their racing Porsches, and we thought we could do it even better. Farley said during the August 17th press preview, the new car is a street-legal limited-edition coupe with a supercharged 5.2-liter V8 engine. Inspired by the Ford Mustang GT3 that's slated to race in the 24 hours of Le Mans, they were told that Ford Obvious they were going to production late in 2024. It's intended to elevate Ford in the eyes of driving enthusiasts who ordinarily would turn to European brands to fulfill their uh, lead foot inclinations. I want to see Porsche. I want to see Aston Martin. I want to see Mercedes sweat, Farley said. Um, so when I speak proudly the following day with a 61-year-old self-described car guy, I've got plenty of questions. He has plenty to say, too. Here's our conversation edited for length and clarity. Um, Jim, you said that when people drive a Porsche, it becomes part of society in a different way than just an automobile. Talk to me about what you mean by that. Um, and what you mean when you say, you know, you want to make Porsche sweat. Um, and I've been a car person my whole life. And when the 1973 Porsche 911 RS came out. It was a car that was different than the Detroit fast cars, different than Ferraris. It was a normal car that was, you know, lightweighted and had a really good engine and it was super well balanced and it drove kind of fundamentally different than anything else you could buy. Um, because, you know, in 1988, I had a five liter Mustang. It was very competitive with the 911, but um, they built that whole business in the collectible market and the exclusivity of, of the opening it and, and tied it to racing um, a whole lifestyle. And we just did Shelby's. So that car has been in my head for 50 years since I first 73 RS. I didn't understand why an American company couldn't compete with the European elite as a challenger, but not do it in the normal American way which is big wheels and, and tires and brakes and a big motor and um, flashy paint and... Um, um, right, because that's not how Porsche is at all. Uh, that's not the way those cars got to be so special. It's actually how all the pieces come together that makes those cars unique. So I think we're an underdog to compete against those cars. Uh, and um, you, you just described a timeline at Porsche that you followed closely. Where is Ford right now on a parallel timeline? Um, I would say we're kind of in the 1990s when they first came out with their GT3 and GT2. They were only in Europe, actually. Um, you almost didn't even know they were actually there, and they didn't market it. It was kind of a secret. Uh, now, you can't keep anything a secret, but I think at the time, uh, they were humble because they were connected to make them a much better mousetrap. And uh, I think we're there. What I guess I'm saying is, you got to earn it. You can't just put in tech and spend a bunch of money. It's, it's more complicated than that. You have to win uh, races. Uh, you have to have the right people to drive the car. Uh, you have to pay attention to excruciating detail before people notice. You have to have different versions. You have to have the option list. Uh, perception trails reality. Um, uh, people will notice after it's already happened and maybe a decade after. So um, that's the long view ahead. Is winning races about proving equipment engineering uh, or is it about gaining attention from consumers as a winning brand? I personally, as a CEO, think it's definitely the latter. Um, if you're not in, in motorsports and you're not successful, um, you're not relevant to this world. Um, uh, for the buyer who can afford it and who appreciates it in GTD, uh, they're going to have the patience to wait for it. Uh, that matters. And they don't not only um, want their slice of that, they want to be associated with a brand that can beat the global competition. Uh, although in motorsports, um, 
You know, uh, you lose more than you win. It's, it's the only sport that happens that way. I want to ask you about a common refrain with regard to this the idea that Ford is the underdog. I've heard you say this a few times, uh, but Ford has been saying that it's the underdog since the 1960s, even since the days of beating Ferrari multiple times at the 24 Hours of Le Mans. Uh, for, uh, for sure. And what does that mean? And there's a better than that, that, that pretty much an airport. And then, but, but what is it might have a done more because it has a CDC that not just be optimizing it, there's the CDs. Where it yes, it was picked, and wouldn't that be unhealthy? You know, no, it's the best thing ever. Why is that? Because uh, I know how car companies work, and uh, car companies get the best out of people when it's a super small challenger team that's kind of off the radar, they have something to prove, and they have like a, a huge chip on their shoulder. Like, I don't care if it's a driver or an engineer, like, if they've got a chip on their shoulder, they are going to work harder than the establishment. And underdog is absolutely fundamental in creating a car like that. And then a single line in Mustang is the best-selling sports car in the world. It often outsells the Porsche 911. Even in Germany, is underdog even accurate? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, because it's, it's underdog based on who we're going after. Uh, we not we are not the underdog when it comes to uh, v6 uh, convertibles in p west we are not an underdog when it comes to renting a car in la and driving at the coast of california if you want a five liter gt and you want to do a, a burnout we're not the underdog we're a we're an ai and then they go to le mans against porsche and mercedes um absolutely an underdog um, with new offers like this GTD and the Mustang Dark Horse, it seems like Ford is really doubling down on Mustang and Bronco. And Bronco. Um, uh, if there's one thing I've learned, because I worked at Toyota for 25 years and I competed against Ford, it's that Ford is best when we do what comes natural to us, which is commercial vehicles. It's a Bronco off-road, it's Mustangs, it's three-row uh, crossovers, bigger vehicles. That's what we do really well. Are electric vehicles natural to Ford? You guys have faced some losses. No, not at all, but the categories we're going after are too okay. Uh, the Ford Lightning truck, uh, actually, it's not getting bought by Ford F-150 customers. It's getting bought by almost all Conquests. It's getting a completely different customer and as that dual mentality created some stress within the ranks, especially with General Motors and Tesla doing so well, it's a tension in the company for sure. If any legacy thinks that they could just walk in there and execute a half-decent EV and put their badge in on and be successful, uh, uh, they're wrong. They're uh, absolutely dead wrong. If we don't make the customer experience competitive with Tesla, with non-negotiated prices and no inventory and remote pickup and delivery for all services. Uh, if we don't get the tech ends, the vehicle right, uh, if we don't own the electric architecture, uh, we're not going to get those customers. They're different than our core customers. Uh, it's a conquest business. It's hard. Is it a challenge to blend those two mentalities within leadership at Ford? I thought it was going to be really threatening for, for the establishment, but, you know, the the transition for the industry is so obvious to everyone. Now that Tesla has to been so successful, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out we have to go to a whole different way of executing an automobile. And I'll tell you, if moving into EVs is a problem, those people won't be on my leadership team for very long. Because why should one person or a group is that person uh, that the cities have indeed and then other time you have 15 million people working on there. Uh, Porsche said they will never make an electric 911. Would you say that you will never make an electric Mustang coupe? Um, I have to say that's kind of cherry picking the reality. They'll make an electric Cayman, they have the electric Taycan. Uh, we have the Mach-E of course, but yes, uh, they would say, uh, uh, you know, that that's a big discussion for, for Bill Ford. And, and my team.
um, I don't know, about 10 years from now. But for the 10 years we're in now, um, a partial electrification is the perfect solution for customers. Um, you can cherry pick up in addition to the electric drivetrain to get everything you need from it, but you don't have to walk away from uh, the emotional part of the experience. Is that the danger that EVs lose the emotional connection to a car? Uh, we cannot keep saying companies are all electric or all hybrid and there's nothing in between. That's baloney. There's going to be lots of gray degrees of partial electrification. It's still good for the planet. You can still have that emotional experience. I think that's where we're going to be for a while. Uh, so when you say, could it be a fully electric Mustang coupe? Nah, probably not, but could there be a partially electrified Mustang Coupe and it be world class? Yeah. Let's see what Porsche does. Let's see if they take any electrification and put it in that 911. Um, I find that pretty hard to believe. Um, 